Walkim, the world's leading manufacturer and innovator of water treatment controllers and metering pumps, has just released Walkim Fluent. Fluent, a cloud based software tool for more easily managing your water treatment services. Fluent provides streamlined remote monitoring and control, data management, and alarm capabilities, including escalating notifications. Save time and stress by learning more about Fluent. You're sure to love it, and so will your customers. Go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash Walkim to find out more. Walkim, turning real water treatment problems into solutions for you and your customers. Welcome to Scaling Up H2O, the podcast where we scale up on knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. My name is Trace Blackmore. I get the privilege of hosting this podcast. I get a lot of privileges with this podcast. Uh, We hosted an after hours hang during the AWT convention that I'm going to tell you a little bit about because we're going to do that again, but that's going to be at the end of the episode. But I, of course, get the privilege of hosting that as well. So, so many awesome things because of this podcast. I hope you feel the same way. I hope you get great information from Scaling Up H2O. I hope you feel connected with other members of the Scaling Up Nation so you know that you are in a job of other water treaters that are doing the same thing that you're doing so you feel connected. And with things like The Hang, I'm hoping to give you opportunities so you can meet some of those other water treaters. Well, today's show is airing on Friday the 13th, and a lot of us have heard that there is a superstition about Friday the 13th. And several of you might remember episode 103 that aired on another Friday the 13th. I did What Water Treaters Fear. So if you haven't listened to that or if you haven't listened to it in a while, maybe uh, you want to get into the scary water treatment mood. Two weeks ago, I read Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven on the air. That was episode number 167. So all of these things about fear, about Friday the 13th, and I thought I'd talk a little bit about that. So there's a word out there called uh, trescadecophobia, which is fear of the number 13. So Hammurabi's Code actually had number 13 omitted from it. I'm sure that you have been in a building where the floors on the elevator go 10, 11, 12, 14 for that superstition. And then, of course, there's Friday. There's some boat captains that will not leave on a Friday. I love the show on the Discovery Channel, Deadliest Catch. And if you guys remember Captain Phil, he would never leave on a Friday. He would reschedule so he was not leaving on a Friday. Modern day Friday the 13th references can be traced back to 1907 from a book called Friday the 13th, written by a gentleman named Thomas Lawson. Now, he had written in his book that a stockbroker did several things to create a crash in the stock market on Friday the 13th. And exactly one year later, the bank panic of 1907 happened. Now, of course, all of us listeners, we probably don't remember that, but maybe we've read about it. That is when depositors just did not believe in the banks. And they wanted to take all their money out of the banks. And of course, the financial economy just collapsed there. And they did some things to build confidence back up. But the New York Times credits Friday the 13th and that book for being one of the causes. So the New York Times has been credited with being the first media outlet to really bring Friday the 13th into modern day because of that book, because of that bank crash. And then, of course, who can forget Friday the 13th, the horror series, 
course, that is what has brought Friday the 13th into pop culture. We all think of Jason Voorhees. So whatever your connection is to Friday the 13th, are you scared? Does Friday the 13th worry you? Would you plan to do something on Saturday because the Friday might fall on a 13th? I don't know. I tell you, I don't think I've ever done that, and I really don't give much thought about it. I did think that that would be an interesting thing to talk about on the podcast, where that comes from. You know, I truly believe the more prepared you are, the luckier you are. And I don't believe in a lot of superstition. I don't think I believe in any superstition. Uh, I like to have fun with it. But the more you prepare, the more you begin with the end in mind and you think about all of the various steps that you have to do in order to get to that end and you prepare for that, the more likely you're going to create your own luck. And I definitely think that that is true when it comes to water treatment. Think about when you're servicing. If you just get in your vehicle and you start servicing Nine times out of 10, there's going to be something that you possess that you do not have with you that you're going to wish you had because it would have solved the problem. But if you didn't think it through on the top end, you didn't think to bring it with you, and now you've got to go back. So I truly believe the more prepared you are, the luckier that you are during a service. That definitely means that you're going to have more of the correct repair parts, but it also means that you're going to be thinking about the equipment that you're servicing. And when it comes to equipment, we've got different sides of equipment. We've got equipment that we are treating, that our water is running through, that we have to make sure that we understand that our customer is relying on us to treat properly. But then we also have the equipment that feeds our control program. And we've got controllers, we've got pumps, we've got valves, we've got all of these other things that allow us to do what we do so we can properly treat our customers' equipment. Well, today we're going to talk about something that I'm sure you probably haven't thought about in a very long time. You just hook it up, you set it, and you forget it. And if nothing goes wrong with it, you probably don't give it a second thought. Well, today we are going to bring that guy out into the spotlight. What am I talking about? I'm talking about our product feed pumps. We're going to give our feed pumps some airtime today. And with the help of Jared Gable of Grunfoss, we're going to talk all things pumps. My lab partner today is Jared Gable of Grunfoss. How are you, Jared? I'm doing very well. Thank you very much, Trace. Well, thank you for coming on Scaling Up H2O. And I think if there's any undertold story, it's the story of the chemical feed pump. And we're going to set that straight today. That's right. So before we do, do you mind telling the Scaling Up Nation a little bit about yourself? Sure, my pleasure. So I went to uh, school at KU and uh, coming into to school there, I was an uh, engineering major. So, you know, growing up as a kid, I'm interested in how things work. Uh, that took me into my first career as a, actually an environmental engineer working for the state of Missouri. And that's really re- where I got my uh, first education on what a, a chemical metering pump really was. And so in the world of water treatment. And then I uh, gravitated, uh, left from there to uh, work for Grunfoss in, in multiple roles, from application engineering to product management. And now I'm in a, a market development role uh, in the water treatment, industrial water treatment market. The best market there is. That's right. So tell us a little bit about Grunfoss. Sure. So Grunfoss is a company that is really set out to pioneer solutions to the world's water and climate challenges. So Anything that we do going forward from here is to improve quality of life for people. And, and the way we're doing that is really through water and digital solutions. So what we do is we fundamentally aim to be market leaders with innovative solutions that really differentiate us from, from others in the market. And we want to do that uh, by bringing things quicker, faster, and simpler. So our developments and pro- uh, products like metering pumps follows that same that path. 
Well, let's talk about the chemical metering pump. I'm sure there's a lot of people that are familiar with that, but if somebody's just tuning in today, they have no idea what we're talking about. How would you explain that to them? A metering pump is basically a uh, a piece of equipment that's taking chemical from maybe a drum or a tank and precisely injecting it into a water line to treat it for whatever the needs are of that system, whether it's a cooling tower, a boiler system for anti-scalants, um, or you're a drinking water plant to inject disinfectants into the line. Because what we know is that when you over or underfeed something like that, it can either be very dangerous to health or it doesn't uh, you know, treat a process the way it needs to be done in industrial applications to satisfy that need. So a metering pump is something that can inject chemical very precisely over a period of time to satisfy the requirements of any process that's treating water. So how has the metering pump evolved over the years? I think early on, metering pumps were, were pumps that were maybe not as, as accurate. So you have like plunger style pumps, um, things with uh, tubes, so peristaltic, and then also is just your motor driven or hydraulically actuated. And those still exist today in large part. So the mechanical pieces around it are, are still used by several manufacturers and the way that drive mechanism works. The things that are kind of coming up in, uh, in, in the market are more around the digitization processes, how the, the pumps work as like little small computers to write algorithms and control microcontrollers to you know, solve processes and, and the, within the application around it. What we're seeing is really not so much a change in the mechanics of the pump, but more so in the way the pumps are actuated with a microcontroller or algorithms that are developed in, within the pumps, maybe sensors that are added to them to really kind of see a, the process in the system around them and start, it, the pump starts diagnosing things in the system and can then automatically correct for uh, situations that aren't, aren't ideal. So that's really where we're seeing a lot of the, the advances come today. They're getting smarter. They're getting much smarter. And, we, and uh, it's one of the things we, uh, I wanted to be able to talk about today is kind of like what I see going on and what we're doing as Grunfoss to, to, to allow others to take advantage of that intelligent technology. All right. And we will definitely get to that. I want to unpack a few things and a few terms that you just mentioned. You mentioned different types of drive mechanisms. So you said peristaltic, diaphragm, I believe you said piston. What, what are the differences between those? Why would you choose one over the other? Historically, what we're seeing is either you're drawing chemical into the pump from a suction lift application where I'm, I have to pull it up several feet into the, into the dosing head, or I could also have a flooded suction application. Um, there are also chemicals that are readily off-gassing, like sodium hypochlorite um, and other acids that want to just, they want to be a gas. So um, anytime you get air inside of the dosing head or allow that to happen, then we have this situation that allows you to vapor lock the pump. So different, different ways to actuate the pump. So whether it's a piston, a peristaltic or diaphragm will have certain benefits in, in that. Uh, in that chemistry that's being injected or kind of the physical setup of the, the suction uh, conditions, whether it's flooded suction or a suction lift. Another consideration are materials of construction. And when you order these pumps, you can order them with a multitude of different heads. How do you know which material to choose for the application that you're using? You know, this is uh, probably one of the number one questions that we get. And when I'm training new people on, on dosing pumps and how to answer that question within our company, it really comes down to either the experience of the person answering that question. So for me, I have confidence saying that sodium hypochlorite or, or a chemical like that works really well with PVC dosing heads or um, Viton elastomers and maybe a ceramic check ball if it's a uh, diaphragm pump. But if you don't know that, there's also some uh, great guidance out there in the Cole Palmer world. So there's a Cole Palmer website. It has uh, a compatibility chart to kind of gives you some guidance. And we always use the word guidance because it's hard to know whether the chemical that's being used is a proprietary chemical with some blend that we don't really know about, or if it's actually something that's more standard in the water treatment world, like uh, bisulfites or 
uh, hydrochloric acids, parasitic acids, things like that. And so we can use the charts that exist and the, the chemical compatibility charts that exist online for us or in other, other areas. Uh, we, we do provide guidance. Uh, a lot of the manufacturers for pumps will provide like a, a guidance sheet for that. Um, but I always tell people, um, our customers, that it's really good to have that conversation with, if you can, the chemical supplier, the end user, and then involve us. And then the three of us together, we can solve that that problem because you know most of the chemical suppliers aren't making the equipment to inject the chemistry and vice versa. So if we all kind of have this open dialogue, and I've had it in the past with with chemical suppliers, and it's a really good one. And they're appreciative of you asking it. So we, we act, actually end up in a way um, satisfying a need for the, the customer and ensuring that when they actually in, install this equipment, it's going to work properly. And that's what it's all about. That's right. Yeah, I'll make sure to put that Cole Palmer uh, compatibility sheet on our show notes page. I know the one you're referring to. That is a good one. And you know, I can't help but think of a story when, uh, you know, I believe it was a PVC head that we had and we were using a phosphonium based biocide and they did not play along very well together. We were doing some uh, field testing for a company and they had just let an employee go and we all thought that he had come into the mechanical room and hit these pumps with a baseball bat. I mean, it just oh. shattered all the stuff. Of course, it was it was bad materials choices. So, um, yeah, you definitely yep. have to know what you're using and what's, what's the right materials and they're compatible. And I can tell you in that case that you just mentioned, I would definitely have to do some more research and digging. And I would most likely ask to speak to the chemical supplier and, and then I can tell them, Hey, this is what we make our pumps out of. I, I know this very clearly. What I don't know is what all the attributes are of that chemistry that you're using. So we have to work together to solve that. Well, you specifically brought up sodium hypochlorite, one of my favorite biocides for treating cooling towers. And you're right, it is a gasser. So I remember in the early 90s, I would spend hours trying to prime pumps. Pumps have gotten so much better since then. What are some of the things that pumps do now that make it so we don't have to spend an hour priming these things? I'm glad you brought that up. One of the number one reasons why where we see issues and uh, basically where we have a lot of success in helping our our customers overcome that, what you find is that if if you re if you remember, there's there's some ways to set the feed rate on the pump, and one of them is the frequency of of strokes. So the the on a diaphragm pump, there's a piston in there that moves back and forth to give it that reciprocating motion, and it will. Uh, either speed up or slow down or happen at different frequencies. So most of the conventional type pumps will have a uh, suction and discharge phase that happens and then it waits a while. And then so every time it goes through a suction and discharge phase, um, it's basically pulling in, pushing out chemistry. And then every time you have a, wa a waiting period, if you have to go and inject a lower feed rate, that's one way to set that. So I can either control the frequency of of the, those pulses, or I can, uh, in the conventional dosing world, you can set the the stroke length. And so that really takes it from a, com a full sweepable volume of that diaphragm through the, the dosing head and cuts it down by a percentage. So usually you can set it to like 50, 20% um, suction stroke or like a 50, 20% uh, frequency. And then you multiply those two percentages together and that's your, your feed rate of the maximum capacity of that pump. So what we've noticed is that when you start injecting a chemical that's like sodium hypochlorite and wants to off-gas readily, it, it basically, if you don't use a 100% sweepable volume or 100% uh, stroke length, you're basically taking that air bubble that gets trapped in there and just making it bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller and not actually moving chemistry. So we're just taking a, a bubble and, and expanding it and contracting it. But if you have a pump that's able to always use 100% stroke length, then we can push those bubbles out. And, and then there's a thing that uh, I'll say it again, the sweepable volume. What that is, is when the diaphragm moves from the back position all the way to the front position to move out as much of that volume that's possible in that dozing head, which then clears and mitigates that issue of vapor locking, which if that happens, you have to go and reprime the pump. 
Is it safe to say if you're using a gassing chemistry, you really don't need to to set the stroke for anything less than 100%? Um, and I yes, and I bet that's really for the the pumps that we we make at Grunfoss. There's a uh, we, all we're doing is controlling the speed now. Mm-hmm. We adjust the speed, and we can do that basically uh, independent of the of the stroke setting. So, or the the where the stroke is at in in the travel. So I can take a suction stroke in very quickly, and then I can push it out very slowly to then dial it down through the turn down ratio or, or get the sweet spot that I need on my, on my feed rate. But uh, all the while I'm still pushing out the chemistry at a hundred percent stroke l- length to get that entire volume displaced in the dosing head. And that really helps us to keep, uh, keep the pump from vapor locking and requiring multiple priming frequencies. That's a great tip. I'm sure we've helped a couple of people out there that are troubleshooting that problem as we speak. You know, people will buy the same pump for just about any product they have on any system that they have. And of course, we need to size those properly. What advice do you have to make sure that we're sizing them properly? So if we need X amount of product fed over whatever length of time, is there a sweet spot that we should say it should do no less than this or no more than that? How should we be sizing these pumps? What you really want to do is first decide what kind of accuracies there are. You know, normally you find a pump that meets exactly what you need, uh, or you build in some factor of safety if you're going through a plant expansion later down the line. So when when we're asking our customers uh, what size pump they need, we're asking for the maximum flow rate that they could need, just like any other pump, and the maximum discharge pressure. If you look at a centrifugal pump versus a a diaphragm pump or a uh, dosing pump, the curve is much different. I don't, I always kind of laugh when somebody asks me for the, the dosing pump curve. Cause I'm like, well, that's really not going to tell you a whole lot of information. It's just a square on the screen. So uh, we're not trying to meet like a, uh, a duty point with, um, a fluctuating pressure. It's just the pump can always pump against whatever that maximum pressure is, regardless of the, the feed rate or the flow rate. So I always start there. And then it's a matter of a question on compatibility like we just talked about. And it, one of the other things is how do you want to control the pump? Are you going to be setting it and forgetting it because it's just rocking in, at a constant feed rate and that's you've got it dialed in with the your process, the water quality never changes? Or could it be that there is a need to adjust based on flow? So m- most of the time I'm seeing installations and applications where the dosing pump is actually flow paced off of like a main process flow. And so then you have a flow meter that can send a signal to either directly to the pump or through some kind of a PLC to, to uh, change that signal and then send a analog signal onto the pump or pulse signal. So those are three of the, the main things that will get me to uh, basically the ballpark of what, what uh, pump needs to be used for that, that application. Uh, one of the things that we've done recently is uh, created like this uh, wizard approach to selection. So we we ask you certain questions that are just common, like what flow and, and pressure do you need? And then also how do you want to control it without really exploiting the fact that we are talking about our specific products and, and you know, proprietary part numbers and, and names of pumps, but more asking the general questions that uh, folks would really know about their application so that they don't have to be experts in dosing pumps. They don't have to worry about that piece. It's it's something that we've trying to trying to do to make this a much easier process in selection for folks because I have realized that there's a certain level of demystification that has to happen when you start talking about uh, metering pumps. And I, I'm, I'm uh, excited to help when that comes about. Awesome. There are other manufacturers that will have a grayed out line, I believe below 20%. Uh, on their stroke. And basically, they're saying that we can't say for the accuracy anything below this. Is it safe to say that if you're in that range, you probably need to get a smaller pump? Yeah, I think it, when you look at those those uh, types of pumps that say that, then of course, you want to make sure accuracy is a very key thing because uh, your end users and your customers that are using these are really paying for the chemical. And the pumps... Uh, are, are over time that operating expenses and, and the capital expenses just pay for themselves with the, the chemistry. So 
it's really important to get a, a pump that's very accurate. You know, you're looking at plus or minus 1%, plus or minus 2% is generally where you're going to be, uh, depending on the application. One of the things that we look at, though, is that steady state accuracy. So steady state accuracy, basically, it's like, where is the, the accuracy based on my set point? And when you're looking at different accuracies of different manufacturers, key in on the fact that they're stating the what what do they mean by their accuracy? Is it a plus or minus one percent of the maximum allowable flow rate, or are you talking about accuracy of the set point that you select? Because those are going to differ quite a bit. So that's one thing to really pay attention to. Uh, we have a pump that's plus or minus 1% through every set point. So, and we're able to do that because we incorporate a sensor in there and it can really dial in on things that are fluctuating in the system. So if you're really key in on accuracy because you have a, a neat chemistry and you have a very sensitive process, then finding that most accurate pump throughout the, to- throughout the entire set point range that's allowable with that pump is, is a good idea. When do you need to calibrate a pump and what is that procedure? Well, calibration is done once the pump is installed in the environment where it's going to operate. So if I if I were to, let's say, for example, calibrate a pump on my desktop and then ship it to you, and then you install it in a pressure that's much different. So the back pressure that I've tested against is different than yours, maybe by 20 or 40 PSI then the calibration is going to be all out of whack by the time you get it and install it. So install it, get the pump to feel the back pressure that it needs to pump against, and then calibrate it. And what we always say is calibrate it on the suction side. So that means do a draw down, not fill up into the calibration column. Uh, this ensures that yeah, the, the pump is actually moving chemistry and it's it, it's independent of, of, the, of the back pressure um, in the system. At that point, it's always pumping what is going through it on the suction side. So you, that's the best way to, to calibrate a pump. As far as what goes into it, it really depends on the, the, the manufacturer's process. One of the things that we do in our pumps is uh, we have a calibration setting. So it goes through a series of strokes and it counts it. So up to maybe 100 or 200 strokes, depending on the models. And once that's done, you basically read the drawdown level of your calibration column uh, physically. And the pump will say, I think you just displaced 100 milliliters. And then you read your calibration column and it says, actually, I've displaced 120 milliliters. So then we would just go in and input that value into the dosing pump and select OK. And then it's calibrated. So it had historically been kind of a complex process where you had to multiply the uh, maximum capacity of the pump. You had to do a, a bunch of other calculations to get there. The pumps have gotten smarter, like we said earlier, and that is not so much the case anymore. So I think it's worth knowing that calibration is an easy thing these days, and it's a, it should be a one-time, one-time deal in the, in the startup or any time we have a fluctuating back pressure on the system. It's a good idea to recalibrate the pump at that, at that phase. And I will say that Again, the, talking about smarter technologies, uh, pumps that are able to automatically adapt to fluctuating back pressure is is then even more hands off when it comes to calibrating. So you don't really have to calibrate pumps that can sense the system around it, and then when you put in your target feed rate, it's just going to go to that speed that it needs to be based on that pressure that it's f- sensing. So, I mean. You can, either, you can make it as complex, I guess, as you want today or as simple as you want, depending on the technologies you choose when it comes to calibration. Jared, what do you think the average life expectancy is of a metering pump? That, that is a good question. So I think, depending on the, the environment you're in, you should, you should have a pump that should last 10, 20 years. Um, and the reason I say that is because there's really only a couple things that you're you're managing on this, uh, you know, following the the instructions of the manufacturer's um, ambient temperature conditions around the pump. Because again, we talk about them as uh, nowadays being these little computers. Um, but as long as we're updating the check valves, diagrams, or any of the, the wet end pieces that are the uh, change out parts, and you're keeping them up, up to date and maintained, the pump should last a long time. 
Jared, let's get into the part that I know you're excited to talk about. What should we expect now with all the changes in technology with metering pumps? Yes, this is the exciting piece. So pumps, metering pumps, any processes that use this type of equipment, it's all about connectivity these days. It's it's how do we step into the next industrial revolution in the, in the, the world of digital enabled products, right? So that's the same case with metering pumps. We, we already know that metering pumps can tell us a lot of information about the system, especially when we add things like sensors to them or specific algorithms that can, that can uh, control things like a stepper motor, for example. So I think what we're seeing now is that I want to be able to remotely get into that pump, get into that application, use the inputs and outputs and the signals that it's picking up around the system to then make good decisions on how I can go about uh, scheduling serviceability or just getting information for reporting, ensuring that the chemical that's being pumped is the right chemistry that's being filled in the tank because the pumps really don't care what it's pumping, but we do. And so having that feedback either remotely and consistently is important, especially in today's day, we're all kind of we're all kind of stuck at home. So imagine being able to tap into a, a site where your assets are and see what exactly what's being pumped. See if there's any alarm codes. Uh, see if I need to deploy a service tech out there in the field to to go address that. And this really gets away from like the the normal way of going about and, and servicing equipment, which is like a monthly schedule or annual schedule. And it's really about working smarter using the smart technologies that we have available today. So I think connectivity and our ability to get in and really exploit the intelligence built into this equipment is the next thing that uh, it's already happening. It's something we're we're doing at Grunfoss. And I'm really excited to start letting people know how this works and providing this option in this in this service to really change business models that exist today some take it away from something that might might be outdated now into the future and and really use the technologies that we have available in your opinion what's been the biggest advantage to the metering pump when it first hit the market to the metering pump we have today metering pumps today are are actually more than just a pump they're they're able to see things around the system. They can detect system changes with sensors and all the smart technologies we we put in it, like microcontrollers, the way we program them per pump to identify what the pump can actually feed as far as feed rate. So what we do is we can start implementing things like these algorithms and and, and uh, calculations combined with uh, stepper motor technology. And the reason I use, we use stepper motors is because we can we can very precisely control the movement of these stepper motors. There's 200 steps between um, rotational angles. And these are very small angles, like 1.8 degrees. And then if we start stepping them down even farther, we can chop that up into smaller chunks and get really precise movement of that stepper motor. And one of the cool things is when you actually tell the pump to speed up or slow down, we can do that on the different suction and discharge phases because of the stepper motor. So we can we can say, all right, when you go through a suction phase, let's bring it back quickly because we want to get back to putting chemical in the process. And then when you, you take advantage of the turndown ratio, we can start putting that in very slowly, which actually reduces the need to install things like variable speed drives or uh, static inline mixers um, or pulsation dampeners um, because we're now reducing all the needs for those things that we would normally have to install them. So we're already using a drive now because the pump, we're able to take the speed of that motor and, and adjust it depending on the suction and discharge phase. And uh, we don't necessarily need a static mixer because we're, we're blending it. Or we're always injecting chemistry in instead of pulsing it in and then waiting and slug feeding. So anytime you have a slug feeding application where it's just injecting with a suction and discharge, then waiting a period of time, then you're not getting a really good blend. So, But if you're using a pump that can slowly push that chemistry into the line over time, then we're constantly feeding the chemicals. Uh, and then we quickly retract to get to the next discharge phase. Um, that's something that's unique. And, and a stepper motor allows us to do that with these pumps these days. Pulsations also are reduced. So pulsation dampeners are actually quite expensive pieces of a, of a system. 
And if you're able to, uh, on small levels, I would say maybe uh, eight gallons or below, eight gallons an hour, then you might consider not actually needing a pulsation dampener because it's not hitting the system really, really hard on a on that small of a volume. Um, and the accuracy is still really great with the pumps at that level. And you get, again, we're getting the nice blending, um, re- reducing the shock of, a, of chemistry going into the system uh, because of the slow, consistent feed rate that is offered using a stepper motor type technology. I think that when metering pumps first hit the market, it was more or less a need to just move the chemical uh, into from point A to point B. And now we're seeing it as more of a, a tool that can operate more pieces of the process. It can not only move the chemistry, but it can do it much more accurately. Um, it can do it more reliably. It can ensure that there's safety measures in place to keep people safe, uh, ensure proper chemistry is happening, and then give feedbacks, uh, alarms, warnings. It can tell us things that's happening around the system. So we can start to see this working as almost a on-site systems diagnostics expert, which I think is uh, really cool. And then being able to tap into that remotely and get that information and push information bi-directionally, it's now allowing us to l- remove pieces like PLCs and other panels that would historically have had to be used and condense our our system into a smaller footprint. We're able to use the technology and the intelligence in our pumps to have faster integration, faster startup, simpler integration into systems. So in a way, it's we're putting a lot of effort on the front end to develop these products now. And by doing that, it's become much easier, simpler, and faster for the end users to implement. So if you haven't upgraded your pump in the past 40 years, you might want to take a look. I think that's a very wise decision. (laughs) (laughs) Let's talk about installation because we could have the best metering pump in the world But if it's not installed properly, it's not going to work properly. And then, of course, that's going to give us problems, which means we're going to call you and give you problems. So you now have the entire Scaling Up Nation listening. What are some considerations that we need to make to make sure that we're installing these devices properly? Yes. So the the biggest thing and one of the weirdest things I've seen is has to do with on the installation of the suction line coming into the pump. Um. I've seen, uh, and you're probably familiar with uh, not just the dosing pumps, but this like a complete dosing system. So there's uh, basically it, it could be two pumps or three pumps on a skid, and then a control panel or valves and such. So what I've seen is, in the past is, is a problem is you'll have like a a pump that requires, and this will come from the manufacturer by the way. They'll say that the requirement on the suction and the discharges maybe an inch pipe or three quarters of inch pipe. But if you have a header on the suction side feeding multiple systems that both require that, that that naturally would mean you would have to increase the size of that suction header. So that way you don't starve the, the two systems and what they, what can happen is the two uh, different systems or multiple pumps on the same header can start battling each other because remember they're, they're reciprocating. They're going through a suction discharge phase. And if one's going through a suction phase while the other pump's going through their discharge phase, that's a conflict. So you can either damage the pumps by ripping out the diaphragms or something else can happen in the system to allow, basically, the, the feed rate will, will not be what you want it to be. So the, the, the process is not getting treated properly. And one of the weird things I've seen where there's been a, a tank like in a room above, and then you have the downstairs level where the, the skids are. You'll have I, ha, I saw where there's like a three quarter inch pipe coming down to feed two large skid systems. So these are pumps that require like one inch to one and a quarter inch suction on each pump. But there is this three quarter inch pipe coming down and then it's teed off to both of the skids. I had one skid on and running, and then I heard this other the other skid, dosing skid and the pumps. I heard the check valves uh, chattering. So that means it was actually hydraulically impacting the skid that was off. And that was uh, just not a good scenario. <laughs> so always be mindful of of your your suction piping, especially maybe you have to add a a, a dampener on the suction side and off, on also on the discharge side, because we want to make sure there's a scenario where if you don't have enough back pressure on the on the discharge side of the pump, 
you can start siphoning and just dumping chemical when it's completely off. So the pumps, they don't have a, a stop inside the heads that doesn't allow the chemistry to push through it. So it, it always wants to go in one direction. But if the, the flow is positive on the suction side, it's just going to push right up as, and if there's not enough back pressure on the, on the discharge side to keep it from doing that. So be mindful of scenarios where you could siphon or just uh, dump your tank overnight because that's never a fun scenario when you have an, especially if you like have an inspector coming out the next day and you've just dumped your entire batch of sodium bisulfide into a tank. You don't want to do that. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, that always seems to happen on the most expensive product that you have on a contract account right after you filled the tank up. I don't know how the pump knows to do that, but uh, <laughs> uh, well, let me ask, what are some things that we need to know as far as troubleshooting? So are there common pieces of uh, replacement parts that we need to keep with us? Are there certain tasks that we have to know what to do that we should be versed in what to do before we're calling the manufacturer asking for help? Yeah, absolutely. There's, um, again, I'll point to the, the dosing head and the wet end of the pump. So this is where a lot of the troubleshooting comes. Um, sometimes it's that my pump isn't actually moving chemical. This could be due to uh, some kind of air coming into the head whether or it's, or it's not seating at the, at the check balls. Um, if this happens, there's some things that you can do. So you need to know how to take the dosing head apart. And those are usually in the INO or maintenance instructions for a dosing pump. It's usually a pretty easy process. So you're removing four to six head bolts, and then you can basically see everything that's happening. And then usually the uh, check valves will be something that you can just unscrew. And I always talk about using like hand tightening or using your hands to do this because a lot of times these pumps are plastic and you start getting a wrench on there. And what we see is a lot of times people will over tighten, they'll strip it out or they use a wrench and it just ends up destroying the pump. So hand tighten is, is always the best or get some kind of a cloth around the jaws of your channel locks to make sure that you're not really ripping it. So it's it, they're sensitive. They're plastic. It's PVDF, Kynar, for example, it's kind of a, a softer material. Uh, PVC can just, and P, uh, polypropylene, for example, could be more brittle and they could just crack. So be aware uh, of that. And then um, always make sure you have any, if, you, if you're actually not getting chemistry to flow through it, it could be that your check ball has maybe a piece of debris in it or it's, it's not been wetted properly yet to be started. And so we want to make sure that we can create that seal every time on the, on the seat. And anytime that doesn't get done, you're not going to be able to move chemistry or it, because it's basically like a, a diaphragm and check, the check valves have to work in unison to actually move the chemical through it. So those are, those are probably the major and most common the things that happen upon like a startup, or even if it's been running over time, let's say they maybe move the system around and, something gets dislodged or and finds its way in between the check ball and that seat, you're going to have to clear it out before it actually works properly. At what point should we call the manufacturer and ask for help? So this is going to be more on the, I would say the electronic side. If And, and a lot of times the pumps will have some kind of a warning that says uh, something that uh, to the effect that it's maybe the, the motor is not working correctly or or if you're if you're noticing that it's just pumping without a signal, for example, just the weird stuff. Like let's say you have a uh, four to 20 milliamp signal coming in and, and it's not reacting to that for some reason, there could be something on the P, uh, PCB side of things that nobody in the field is going to be able to know what to do. Uh, so anytime you get into the, the pump uh, and it's just doing something just completely strange electronically, that's when I would normally directly go to the manufacturer because if you try to start opening up the, the body of those pumps, uh, you, you can risk things like avoiding the warranties and it just takes any of the control out of uh, our ability to identify the problem later and then give you know credit back to, the, to you as a customer. So don't, don't be opening the, uh, the brains of the pump, I guess, uh, if, you're not a, if you're not a brain surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's a great way to put it. What's the one thing that you see people doing that you just want them to stop doing it? <laughs> I I have to laugh at this because it, it's maybe more of a, a pet peeve of mine, but um, I know that it's very common to 
Just power pumps on and power pumps off. I know that. I get it. But the pumps have, these days, the ability to take signals. And there's a lot of signals that we send it from PLCs, like like I said earlier, a 4 to 20 milliamp signal. And you can you can basically stop the pump by sending it 0 or 4 milliamps. But there's also, in, in most of the pumps nowadays, you can just say, hey, I want to give it a discrete uh, contact closure to start or st- remotely stop the pump. And all, all I would say is just, let's take advantage of that technology where you can just use a simple relay to start and stop the pump with a command. Um, the, one of the reasons I like this as opposed to just applying power and turning it off, because like I said earlier, these metering pumps these days, are they're smart, they're, they've got computers built into them. So if you start cycling power on and off and on and off, that's that's not a good recipe for a product that you want to last a long time. So take advantage of the remote on off type of scenario instead of powering it on and off. Uh, it's just, to me, that's just a that old school way of, of doing it when the pumps are much smarter now to be able to use just a simple contact closures, potential free signal. What do you want the bottom line of today's interview to be? What do you want people to leave listening to you and I having this conversation? What do you want them to take home? That's a great question. I would just say that be open to the new technologies that are out there. I want to encourage anyone that relies on chemical feed equipment or other process equipment to use those intelligent built-in features that come with this, the technology today. Use it to propel them into the industrial revolution and the world of digital-enabled products that we see coming down the line. You know, Pumps can now sense things that are not well in a system, so they can sense faults, they can sense failures, and they can automatically adjust to, to hit the target performance that the end users and our customers are, are looking to get. We can use this cloud-based communication and cellular con- connectivity today, like a narrowband IoT, for example, that can penetrate deep into to rooms and concrete walls. Uh, with all, since all we're doing is really transferring low amounts of data, that's all we would need. And then we can get that feedback remotely. So being able to do this, get all this input, do it remotely, I think it means that business models and the way that we've been doing things with routine service calls is is getting ca- kind of tired and outdated. And we have we have things that we can spend our time doing that's more proactive now by seeing this information that the pumps and this technology is actually giving us. So, you know, now that our pump technology is smarter and more efficient, I think that we should start acting the same way. If somebody wants to learn more about the things that you were talking about today, where can they go? We have a, a Grunfoss Technical Institute. It's a it's a website that allows you to go on and learn different things about pumps and systems. I would point anyone to that space within Grunfoss. Uh, we have things on uh, step promoter technology. We have th- uh, information on our metering pumps as well as just some basic courses uh, of what a metering pump is. And there's even a, a systems course. So that takes all the pieces of a of the system around a pump and tells you what they're used for and, and why you would, would need to use them in a uh, dosing application. Well, I have a few more questions for you. These are the lightning round questions. So are you ready for those? Let's do it. All right, so you can now go back in time and speak to your former self on your very first day as an engineer. What advice would you give yourself? I would just tell myself to be ready to have your eyes truly opened <laughs> because, uh, you know, I, I, I think we would take for granted all that goes inside, like these inconspicuous water plants and booster houses that we see, our water towers, but... Uh, with my experiences now uh, coming from the state of Missouri as a regulator and then in my equipment provider role here with Grunfost, it's uh, quite eye-opening. Now Now I think about things like, hmm, where did that water come from? What was uh, <laughs> What was it actually before it hit the first treatment plant? You know, w- what should I be thinking about before I go take a hot shower in a hotel concerning... Yeah, things like Legionella. So I, I think about all these things now, and I really didn't think about any of that before. <laughs> yeah, ignorance is bliss, right? I kind of was. It's like, hey, count yourself lucky. I guess is what I would tell myself. But uh, <laughs> get, ready, get ready for a uh, get ready for a ride here. <laughs> what are the last few books that you've read? Oh uh, yeah, it's it's been a little while, but I, I read a, a book called The Challenger Sale, which is kind of more of a sales approach. Oh, to, that's a great one. I think it was it was a really cool book. Um, kind of show me like 
what kind of conversations you would should expect to have with customers to make sure you hit their actual needs, which that's kind of in a nutshell what it did. But uh, it was a great, great guidance book. I read another one called Leadership and Self-Deception. So that was more like an inward looking uh, book, uh, how people, how you should treat people like people and things like that. But it went through a really nice narrative between a, a boss and a new employee and uh, a manager and kind of how they were seen through an organization to flip the mentality of everyone from the secretary to the CEO, how they're all aligned on the same page as far as their mindset to treat everyone like a person, know their names. And I thought that was a really great book. And then I'm a sucker for some kind of sometimes the the fantasy stuff. So I, re- I read Mrs. Peregrine's Home for Particular Children, and I, before I saw the movie this time, which I think for me is a big accomplishment. <laughs> I didn't read the book, but I did see the movie with my wife, and she said the book was so much better. It always is, isn't it? That's that's what they say, and 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 I, I think they're right. So, uh, well, speaking of movies, when they make one about you, who plays you? This uh, I would think. I'm going to say Paul Rudd, and there's a couple of reasons. So I'm a KC guy. I live in Kansas City, and I went to KU. So right there, it kind of already kind of ties me into him, right? He's kind of goofy. I, I tend to be a little bit on the goofy side. Uh, I think we're both comfortable on stage. Uh, I play in bands. I have played in, I don't know, in and out of 10 different bands throughout my career, and uh, that's one of the things I, I continue to do. But, uh, you know, he can also play the role of a, a quiet nerd, science lover type guy and a, and a superhero all in one. I think, I feel like that that really embodies what, what I would like to be trade as. <laughs> <laughs> Great choice. Now, my final question, if you could speak with anybody throughout history, who would it be with and why? Well, you know, I'm not much of a history buff or anything, but I think since I have ties to, to music, I, I select John Lennon. I think he had a lot of important things to say socially and uh, about the world that he lived in. And I would, I would be curious to kind of pick his brain to see what motivated him to, to speak on the things he spoke on and what inspired him to write the type of music he made because it really propelled a, a lot of bands and, and artists even now to make the kind of music they're making. It, it also seems like I think he'd be interested to learn about water treatment. You know, he, he seems like he'd be a good listener. <laughs> Now, you didn't mention you know, when you introduced yourself about music. Tell us about that. Yeah. Uh, so music, I guess, is a, is a part of me. It's like I have arms, legs, a head, and then I have music as another appendage, I, if I were to think about it that way. I can't seem to break out of that world, and I, I'm not apologetic about it, but it's been a, a, lot, a lot of fun these, these past few years. It's, it's kind of how I met my wife, so through friends, my music. Brought her friends to our shows back in college, and and I met her, so we started hanging out. And uh, I have a wife and two kids now, two boys. Um, I still play music. I play in a a Green Day tribute band. Uh, so I don't know if you like Green Day or not, but absolutely. I uh, I tend to um, be able to sing his stuff pretty well, and so uh, it's a fun show. We have a lot of fun. We we do a, a good job, me and the band, of portraying the Green Day band. <laughs> I, but I also enjoyed, I also enjoy country music. I, I toured in a, a country, a Nashville country band for four years uh, before this. And I kind of get into whatever uh, feels right, you know? Well, cool. If, uh, do you guys have any CDs out? I mean, there's no CDs anymore. Is there anything that anybody can download? <laughs> um, I don't have anything. It's been like all cover stuff. I don't own the intellectual property, so I can't do that. But, um, I think there's some uh, Facebook stuff out there you guys can you guys can take a look at. Um, now, the band's name is, I don't know if it's going to be something that's politically incorrect, but we just took it from a Green Day album. So that's my disclaimer. Uh, our band's name is American Idiots, like the album. Gotcha. So that's our, that's, that's our uh, Facebook handle. <laughs> well, we might actually go out there and see what we can find and put on our show notes page. And when we, when we are ready for the Scaling Up Band, we're definitely giving you guys a call. Hey, we got you covered. Don't you even worry about that, Trace. <laughs> Jared, thank you so much for, for sharing so much information about the metering pump. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, thanks a lot for having me on the show. Uh, maybe we can do this again sometime. Nation, I can't tell you how many other water treatment companies that I've consulted with that just use one pump. Now, I'm not talking about just one manufacturer. I'm talking about just one pump model. 
And normally it's because they only want to stock one pump. They only want to have repair parts for one pump. But I will tell you from experience that it does not make things easier. Now, maybe it does. You don't have to stock a lot of things. You don't have to bring in a lot of repair parts. That might be easier, but the day-to-day -day operation, when you have to hone in, when you have to get precisely the right amount of product into your system, I really think that that is almost impossible if you did not do your homework up front and size the proper pump. Now, for those of you that have been to my math class, you know that I talk a lot about using math up front, so more time up front to save us time on the back end. I think that's a good segue from our introduction that we did earlier. We create our own luck in the field by the preparation that we do before we start installing all of our equipment. So what's the system volume? What is the output that that pump needs to do every day? every hour, every minute. And now we can get very close to what needs to be fed and find the proper pump to feed that product. Now, normally we give a little bit of leeway so we can do a little bit less, we can do a little bit more, but if we've calculated that, that is a great choice. And we can now dial in the exact dosage amount so we are feeding the product properly. And folks, I'm willing to bet that if you spend the extra time up front doing some of those calculations, you are confident enough in your selection of a pump that you would even set it on 13% on Friday, no less. Folks, one of my favorite things that I did during the AWT conference was I got the privilege of hosting the After Hours Hangs. Many of you in the Scaling Up Nation attended, and many of you have asked me to bring that back. You said it was great to have networking with other water treaters, with other suppliers. That way you can get your name out, you can learn new people, you can figure out a new network of people that you might be able to call and ask questions to. Well, folks, I heard you, and so did everybody at AWT, so we are going to do that very thing. We are bringing back The Hang, and that is going to be on December 10th at 6 p.m. So if you will, mark your calendars for December 10th at 6 p.m. And you might be asking, I didn't attend the hang. I have no idea what you were talking about. Trace, what is this hang? Well, I'm glad you asked. And simply what it is, it is a Zoom call, but it's not like a regular Zoom call. What we're going to do is we'll start out in the main Zoom room. I'm going to try to entertain you for a few moments, and then I'm going to place you into separate breakout rooms. That means you're going to go from a room of hundreds of people into a room of about five people. Now, you are going to then get a few leading questions from me on how to get the conversation started, and you're going to begin to meet new people. There might be some other water traders. There might be some suppliers. So. All types of water treatment professionals are going to be in that room, and it's going to give you the opportunity to meet people that you would not have had the opportunity to meet for. Sounds awesome, right? Well, we will then bring you back from that breakout room and then send you into another breakout room where you're going to meet five other people. After that's all said and done, I'll bring you back in the main room. I'll give you some more entertaining tips, maybe ask a couple of questions from some of the groups. And then at exactly one hour's time, we will say goodbye and I'll let you know when the next hang will be. So many people attended when we did this during AWT and it was a great success. And I know it will be a success again on December 10th at 6 p.m. if you are there. So please mark your calendars, but don't just do that. Go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash hang, H-A-N-G, so you can register and get that in your calendar so you are ready for it. Now, folks, you can use a mobile component of this. You can use your phone. 
You can use your laptop. You don't have to be in your office in order to experience this hang. So the only thing you have to do is just log in, be there, and be ready to introduce yourself and talk to some other water treaters. And probably the best part, it is absolutely free. And how many things in life are free? This allows you to meet other Scaling Up Nation members. And uh, who knows? You might meet somebody that has the answer to that question that you've been burning to know what the answer is. There's no doubt about it. Our job can be a lonely job. We're driving from account to account. It's great when we're in front of the customer, but then when we're on the road going to the next account, a lot of times we are wishing that we had somebody else to talk to. I know that's why this podcast is so successful, but folks, that's also why these hangs are successful. You don't know who you don't know, So meet some new people on December 10th at 6 p.m. Again, go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash hang so you can register and you can be there. I look forward to being there on the hang with you. I also look forward to next Friday where I will bring you a brand new episode of Scaling Up H2O. In the meantime, I hope you are safe and have a great week, folks. Nation, one of the things the Rising Tide Mastermind tries to do is teach us new lessons. Here is Michelle Farmery explaining some of the lessons she's learned as she's been a member of the Rising Tide Mastermind. It teaches you to approach your goals in a different light. Um, You're reading different books. So A, it's cutting down your screen time and increasing your knowledge because you're putting yourself outside of your comfort zone. One thing that I think is awesome is that it teaches you to actively listen. I think all too often um, as adults, whether young adults or older, we were so focused on, on hearing what we think somebody is saying and not actually hearing what's being said. And it, it's nice to kind of take that step back and actually listen to someone and hear what they need and not what we think they need. And, and so that, you know, I've loved that benefit of it, of changing the way that you, you listen and think. Michelle, thanks for that. There's no doubt about it. We don't know what we don't know. And when we can get together with peers, we can see those blind spots and help point them out to each other. If we're not learning something new each and every day, you've heard me say it on this show before, we are not doing our jobs correctly. Well, the Rising Tide Mastermind helps with all of that. And the bottom line is we try to make each other better each and every time we get together. To find out if the Rising Tide Mastermind is right for you, go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash mastermind.